Pope Francis, he says, nobody is too sick to be attended by a doctor. You know, sometimes in our churches, that's the criticism that's been made to us. We are, we are telling a lot of people, you're too sick to see a doctor. And Gerald O'Connell, who's a major columnist in, in uh, journalist in Rome, this is his description of the type of church that Francis wants. He says, Francis wants a church that's on mission, reaching out to others and accompanying them, especially those in the peripheries, a merciful church that is a field hospital for many wounded of this world, a church that builds bridges, not walls. He wants a church that is poor and for the poor, one that rejects careerism, a church that is committed to encounter, inclusion, and reconciliation, not one that is confrontational, self-reverential, or judgmental. He wants a synodal church in which bishops and the faithful people walk together and authorities understood as service. Let's try to unpackage that. This year, Pope Francis is called a year of mercy. He wants Christians to celebrate mercy, to think about mercy, to pray about mercy, and especially in our lives, to receive mercy. And he wants to, us to put a more, 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 more merciful face on what? Remember a journalist asked me once, says, isn't Pope Francis just trying to make the church look better by doing this? Well, the answer is partially yes. But first of all, long before we try to make the church look better, this year's an attempt to make God look better. You know, God gets terrible, terrible press for the most part on this planet. Uh, it's true. So many people don't go to church, and so many people are angry at religion and atheism and so on. S almost all of that is spawned by bad religion. Michael Buckley, the great Jesuit uh, intellectual who wrote that monumental book on atheism 20 years ago, and Michael Buckley says, all atheism is a parasite on bad religion. So you know, parasites live in a body. <laughs> parasites can't live alone. Atheism is a parasite. It has to have something to live on. You know what it lives on? It lives on bad religion. You know, we have made God look stupid, unintelligent, unmerciful, legalistic, judgmental. The list can just go on and on and on. And um, all of that is, is it's, it's not worthy of religion. It's not worthy of Jesus. It's not worthy of God. So the first, the first reason why we need to put a, mercy, a more merciful face onto our own lives and our churches is to, to, to give God more credibility. See, God's face in this world is, are, is our faces, and to the extent that our faces are judgmental, angry, self-reverential, all these words used, to that extent, God has no credibility and shouldn't have in the world. So the first, the first reason, the first reason is not just to make the church look good. We have to try to make God look good. And um, I was in Seattle recently, and I, I spent 24 summers in Seattle teaching at Seattle University. And I met one of my old students who says, you know what I remember from your class? And I've always cherished it. He said, don't make God look like an idiot. <laughs> okay. Okay. And that, that's the challenge. Don't make God look like some legalistic, judgmental, um, less than intelligent, compassionate person. Secondly, it, it is to put a merciful face to the church, and, and especially for, John, for Pope Francis, on all its pastoral actions. But Francis is saying, though, and, and all of us in this room, said when they meet you, they need to meet a merciful face, not a legalistic face, a programmatic face, and so on. Let me tell you a story, and it's a good story. I'll give you a happy story. About a year ago, I went to see my dentist, and the dental hygienist says to me, she says, are you a priest? I said, yeah. She says, well, I'll tell you a story. She said, I'm a Baptist, said, but I came to religion on my own. She says, my father, who's still alive, he said, he's an agnostic. He's a benign agnostic, but he's an agnostic. She said, and my mother was a raised Roman Catholic, but hadn't been to church for more than 50 years. You know, she she's just drifted away. Said, so both my mother and father went through 50 years of their marriage with really no religion. Said, and last year my mother died. She said, and so my dad said, well, we have to arrange a funeral somewhere. And he said that she was a Roman Catholic, so I guess we should bury her as a Roman Catholic. So we went to a, a, a parish. 
So we met a wonderful priest. And we said, could we have our mother's funeral? He said, of course you can have your mother's funeral. He said, and he was just wonderful. He said he gave my mother, hadn't been in church for 50 years. He said, they gave her this wonderful funeral. The women came out and sang and so on. He said, my dad, who's been agnostic his whole life, has joined the church on the basis of that. Now, how much different that had been if the priest would have said, well, now you come after 50 years. <laughs> where, where have you been? See, see, just the face of mercy pastorally. See, that's God's face. And so it's not a chance to chance, uh, an opportunity to make the church look better in the light of spotlight and what we've taken in terms of sexual abuse or credibility hit. It's to make God look good. It's to make the churches be the, the field hospital of mercy, which we'll talk about. Then secondly, he said, to put a merciful face to the poor. So that, um, as you know, Pope Francis comes from Latin America and he knew poverty and he worked with the poor. In fact, all the years when he was a bishop and a cardinal, he didn't own a car, he went to, to, to work on a bus. Um, but he wants us to be a church, he said, that is particularly merciful to the poor. And then he said, particularly merciful to the broken. In fact, that's been one of his dominant themes and one of his dominant things in his own pastoral action, to the broken. Now he called the Synod on Family Life, which went on for a couple of years, and with a lot of controversy, not all the bishops and Catholics have bought into his, his vision and so on. But one of the reasons he called, well, one of the reasons, the main reason he called the Synod on Family Life and Marriage is because so much of family life and marriage today is broken. And he said it needs to be looked at, it needs to be rethought in a whole different way. So an example, one of his strong examples was this. He says, you know, in cla classical Catholic teaching, doctrine, we do this. You get married and you say, for better, for worse, and, and you, when we said the, the marriage bond is unbreakable, okay? But in fact, today, more than 50% of marriages break up. And oftentimes, particularly with young people, the first marriage was, it shouldn't have happened. <laughs> okay. So, and, and oftentimes, those first marriages, oftentimes, they, you know, in, in many people's lives, they're disastrous, sometimes they're abusive, they're demeaning. And then the couple breaks up, they get a civil divorce, and so on. And then, oftentimes, they fall in love and marry somebody else again civilly, and the second marriage is wonderful. So it's life-giving. So Pope Francis says, according to classical Catholic thought, we say, now they're living in sin, because they're happy. <laughs> and before, this woman was in an abusive relationship, you know, but that was sacramental. He said, that needs to be rethought, you know? What does it mean to be sacramental? If you're in a relationship that's destructive of you, we say, that's, that's sacramental. And now we're in a relationship that's actually um, lifting you up. It's gracing your life. And you say, now you're living in sin. He said, what, what are we saying? He said, we need to not change doctrine. He said, we need to rethink our pastoral practice to bring it into the line of mercy. A little joke on this. When I was studying in Belgium, I was living at the American Seminary, and there was a, a woman who was in, in house cleaning, very, very colorful woman, you know, uh, full of life and so on, but she's a little like the woman in, in John's Gospel with the four husbands, and the one she's living with is not her husband. <laughs> so one day there was a reception at the school, and the Cardinal, Cardinal Danielle's from uh, Brussels came, and of course we're all in receiving line, he's making polite conversation with each, and finally he comes to this woman, her name is Barbara, and said, this is Barbara, and she works in housekeeping. And so he's, you know, he's trying to make conversation, so he said, are you married? And Barbara said, well, your eminence says, I'm, yes, no, she said, actually I'm living in sin. <laughs> <laughs> and they both laughed, the Cardinal's credit, he got it, okay, you know, said, so I'm actually, it's an expression we use. And Pope Francis, we, we need to think about how we format all of this without changing Catholic doctrine, without changing Christian things on the insult, indissolubility of marriage, without changing our fundamental teachings. He said, it's not a question of having to change anything except our practice. You know, we need to be compassionate within the truth. Later on, I will talk about the truth and compassion and how they go together. So it's especially an outreach to the broken. And today, 
most family lives and stuff, it is broken. You've had a fracture, you've had two fractures and so on. And Francis said, we have to find a path, a full path for these people, that's us, to come back to the church, to access God's mercy without guilt and so on. Um, it hasn't always been popular. It's about the year of mercy. Then he says, in our outreach to sinners, to people whose lives are broken in moral ways. See, broken marriage, your life is broken in a sociological and psychological way, but a lot of lives are broken in moral ways where there is real sin. And that's particularly whom Christ came for. You know, that was yesterday's gospel, or two days ago when everyone said, I haven't come for the virtuous, I've come for sinners. Remember, Jesus defines himself as a doctor, as a physician. And we're going to come back to that analogy. You know, a doctor isn't so concerned about guarding truth and the treasure chest of deep truths and so on. A doctor is very much concerned about somebody's health. And in that sense, <laughs> to some of Francis's statements that have been been taken, you know, and 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 really, you know, people still saying hallelujah, and other people who who say, well, how can he say stuff like this? But for instance, one of the things that on, on, for instance, take the Catholic thing on birth control. Now, Francis isn't changing the teaching, but Francis is putting it to a different place. Remember his expression on birth control? He says, don't ask somebody with major health issues about their cholesterol and sugar levels. You know, cholesterol and sugar levels are important. Um, if you're struggling at some other level, they're unimportant, you know. See, he's doing the old Catholic hierarchy of truths and so on, and what's important. And always behind it, we'll see that image of a field hospital. Okay, so, so our outreach has to be to the poor, the broken, sinners, and then also to Mother Earth. No pope has ever written uh, so much in defense of the planet Earth as Pope Francis. So he said, your mercy doesn't just go to people, it has to go to people, and not just the broken people and sinners. Mother Earth is pretty broken today, too. So he said that our, we have to put a more merciful face towards ecology, towards the planet. Um, and he's taken a lot of heat for this, you know, because um, he does believe in climate change. He does believe that, you know, we, we've, we, we're going too far in terms of what we're taking from Mother Earth. And so he said our mercy has to extend to people it has to extend to the planet, okay? Then, he says, it has to, our mercy has to extend more to our interactions with other faith, faiths and those who are searching religiously. So he said, Catholicism, Christianity, we can't be bastions, castles anymore. Where we have the truth, and there's Buddhists, there's Hindus, there's Muslims, so on. He says, no. Uh, the mercy of the face of God, it, it, we have to be much more ecumenical, we have to be much more interfaith. We have to begin to see all believers as our brothers and sisters. And not just all believers, notice the last thing, and those who are searching religiously. You know, some people don't believe, but they're searching. Our empathy has to go out to them. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a wonderful text in the Acts of the Apostles. I almost, I've often thought about this text, very colorful text, but it's, it's early on in, in, in the first apostolic era, and um, Peter raises a guy from the dead. So I think it's Peter and James. But they raise a man from the dead, and uh, the people are so impressed. So they come and they want to try to um, give them worship the way they would worship a god. And they said, the high priest of the pagan rite, he came <laughs> and he wants to offer worship. What does that say? This is a very sincere man. You know, he was the high priest of their pagan cults. When he saw a miracle of God, he fell on his feet. See, um, there's a lot of sincerity out there that doesn't have got a Christian face, hasn't got a Muslim face, hasn't got an Islamic face. It's just a human face. It's a searching face. It's searching for God. So he said, our, our compassion, notice this is a long list, on God, the church, the poor, the broken, sinners, Mother Earth, Protestants, other Christians, Muslims, Jews, um, New Age people, and 
people who are atheists who are searching. And then he says, finally, our mercy has to extend to the church's weakness. You know, we're a flawed institution. We have the Holy Spirit and we have Jesus and so on. At the same time, the other part is made up of human beings like ourselves who sin. And that there's a, there's a powerful grace component to the church and there's a powerful sin component. And he says, our mercy has to also go out to the church's weakness. You know, um, and the weaknesses are real because we're, we're human beings. That's why I liked so much the song we just had from Mary Goetz, who says, the church in my country needs some mercy, you know? We, the church need, itself needs to be mercifully seen, as opposed to, you know, where we, for all of our own reasons, a lot of times we're gleeful, you know? I can watch the movie Spotlight and, and, and feel empathy for the church, or I can watch the movie Spotlight and say, there are these sons of so-and-so as they finally get it, you know? See, there's mercy, there's hardness, and so on. So he says, for us to, to, to put a merciful face to God, this is what we have to do this year. Now, the second part, he says, but to do that, we have to do a, a, a series of, I guess scholars would say, paradigm shifts. We have to do some radical shifts, not in dogma. See, it's interesting. Pope Francis has shook up the church completely. He hasn't changed a single teaching. He has changed a lot of emphasis, okay? He's, he, and I'm going to give you some of these emphasis. He says, first of all, an ecclesial emphasis, that's church, we have to shift from an ad intra to an ad extra emphasis. You know what? He gave a speech in the, the conclave, which probably led to his election. He looked at the church the last 25 or 30 years and said, we did some wonderful things, he said, but we slowly became turned inward, slowly we became self-reverential, we slowly, the church became about the church and not about the world. That's a death wish, see? The church can't be about itself. The church is for the world. Um, we sometimes forget that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that, uh, I'll take the second bullet with this to explain the two. Let me get to give you an example. Some years ago, I was listening to a, a, an interview on a radio station with a cardinal in this country. He had just become cardinal of a major city, okay? And the journalist asked him, it was a female journalist, she says, uh, your eminence, because that's what you call a cardinal. She says, your eminence says, now you've just become cardinal of this major city. She said, what's the single most important agenda item for the church today? It's a good question, I've asked you. What's the single most important thing the church should be addressing today? He's a very sincere man, very prayerful man. He says, today is that we need to defend the faith. He said, Christianity, we're under siege, and we need to solidify, we need to defend ourselves. Well, that's noble, that's also not right. Okay, I'll contrast it. Remember once actually in Louvain, when I was studying there, and Cardinal Hume, Basil Hume, Cardinal of London, was there, and at a certain point he was giving a press conference. This is back in 1983, and some journalist asked him exactly the same question. She said, Your Eminence, says, what's the most important single item that the church needs to address today? What should be the most important agenda item for the church? And Hume said, the same as it's been since the time of Jesus. He said, we have to try to save the planet. Notice how the difference in emphasis. We have to protect ourselves, we're under siege, and sometimes we are, okay? He said, but that's not why the church exists. The church exists to try to save the planet. Now, let's go back to Jesus. You know, how Jesus defines himself in John's gospel. Jesus says, my flesh is food for the life of the world. No he doesn't say, my church is food for the life of believers. He doesn't say, my church is food for the life of the church. He said, my my flesh is food for the life of the world. So, you know what the church is? The church is an instrument to try to save the world. You know, you get that beautiful image. we just give you one little image, which oftentimes we don't get. The image of Jesus being born and laid in a manger. Remember that beautiful song? Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. So we have this whole uh, iconography 
about Jesus being born. They lay him in a manger. What's the significance of a manger? They're not emphasizing there the poverty of Jesus and Mary and Joseph and born in a stable. You know, incidentally, even with the stable, they're not emphasizing the poverty. They're, 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 they're emphasizing the humanity, the solidarity. So Jesus wasn't born in a palace. He was born outside of a town. So he's going to be an outsider. So it's important he wasn't born in Bethlehem. He's born the outsider. He's born with the poor. He's laid in a manger. A manger is where animals come to eat. It's a trough. A manger is a feeding trough. See, so Jesus is born and he's laid down where animals eat. And he ends up on an altar where human beings come and Jesus, I've come to be eaten up by the world, not to protect myself from the world. And it's interesting, when you look at Jesus, you know, the disciples and the apostles, just like sincere people today, are always trying to protect Jesus from children, from sinners, from prostitutes, from this. And Jesus is saying, I can handle it. <laughs> you know, in fact, bring him here, you know. See, so Jesus, I've come into the world to be eaten by the world. I've come, you know, we exist for the world, you know. We're not the world's enemy, you know. We exist the, sa the same as, for instance, some of you are parents. And your kids may be a little belligerent about religion and so on. They're not your enemy, they're your child, you know. And you have to still try to cajole and lead and so on. See, so we exist for the world. Let me give you, <laughs> I probably shouldn't use this example because it's one of my pet peeves, you know. But you know, whenever you have intentions at mass, you know, the, or what the Aussies call the bidding prayers, okay? And so invariably they, they start this way, you know, the priest leads the prayer, then the reader says, let's pray for the Pope, and let's pray for him, and we pray for the bishop, and we pray for the church, and we pray for this, and the RCA, catechumens, all of which is valid. Then at the end say, let's pray for the poor, and so on. That should completely be reversed. We're not saying mass for the, for the Pope, or for the bishops, or the Catholic Church, or for St. Philip's Parish. We're saying Mass for the world. So the first thing is, let's pray for the poor, let's pray for government leaders, let's pray for Mother Earth, and so on. See, and then later on, we can talk about, pray for the Pope, and I pray for this one every day, and the bishop, and you know, for your aunt who had her kidney out, and all this stuff, and so on. You know, sometimes, <laughs> with prayers, I love some prayers, because they're a complete bulletin board. And the, they also tell God exactly what he should be doing. So uh, I want to pray for my Aunt Martha, who's having kidney surgery, and we hope that it's going to be Dr. Jack, and we hope that um, uh, and exactly, or we're praying for my son, who's going to, and, and it spells out the entire agenda of what God should do. And it's wonderful that we should pray like that, and so on. Okay. But, uh, you know, first of all, when you go to, to church, when you, when, when you go to a, a Eucharist, to Mass, or to, if you're Protestant, you're going to a, a Sunday service and so on. First of all, notice that prayer isn't for you, it's not for a community, that's prayer for the world. And um, so you, you, I remember a priest friend of mine, you know, as a priest, we're supposed to pray Mass for the world. That's your priestly prayer, the same as you, when you go to Mass, that's not a private prayer. That's from your baptism, you're baptized as priests, you're anointed with the chrisma, so that later on, you're supposed to pray for the world. So this priest said, you know, I don't see the breviary anymore. He said, it doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't need to mean anything to you at all. You're not doing it for yourself. When you're praying privately, then that's something different. But when you're saying mass, when you're, you're at mass, or you're at some kind of liturgical service and so on, that, that's, that, that's, that's prayer for the world. It's, you know, St. Matthew's Parish doesn't exist for St. Matthew's Parish. And it doesn't exist for the Archdiocese of, of San Antonio. It doesn't exist for the United States Church. It doesn't exist for, for the Catholic Church of Christianity. It exists for the world, you know. And that comes from Jesus. See, and the Pope is trying to get us back to that. It's as soon as we lose that perspective, invariably we start turning inward, you know. Um, you know, what's, we gotta protect ourselves and so on. And, and, and really, sincerely, in the last 25 or 30 years before, before him, there was a lot of protection, protection. And it's well intended. It's really well intended. We, we got to be careful, careful, careful. And we, you know, Protestants are going to communion. What does that mean? Is it, well, you know, why we should bother any if any Protestants are going to communion? <laughs> you know? Um, see, 
it's sincere, but try to protect yourselves. It's sincere, but it's bad religion. It is just bad religion. Remember, I've been saying that the scribes and Pharisees were really, really good people. They were the people concerned with the values of the church and so on, but they had bad religion. Remember when I gave you the story of the, trying to stone the woman to death for adultery and so on? And Jesus says, you don't stone people with the commandments. In fact, that's one of Francis' pet images. Francis says, always ask yourself in that scene, are you standing with the woman or are you standing with the crowd ready to stone her to death? Um, see, and we do it sincerely. We've got to protect the faith. We've got to protect. We have this treasure chest. And what if somebody's in heresy or whatever? That stuff has its own importance, but it's not the first thing. Notice Jesus didn't try to protect himself. Jesus says, go out there, lay your life down, die for the world. But notice, you die for the world. You don't even die for the church. You die for the world. Okay, then the third one. These tied together. From an ecclesial emphasis on protecting this, from sacred truth to seeing the church as a field hospital and emphasizing Jesus as a physician. Well, there's many dimensions to Jesus. When you teach Jesus, you can emphasize Jesus as a teacher. It's valid. You can emphasize Jesus as a high priest who comes and dies for us. That's valid. You can also emphasize Jesus as a healer, as a, te as a physician. And Jesus puts himself in that role. He says, I've come for the sick. I haven't come for well people. I've come for the sick. You know, and it's so easy for us in all sincerity to him to miss that emphasis. You know, every time somebody says this, it sounds, <laughs> and you can take me on on this after in the question period and so on, where someone says, you know, church is full of hypocrites. You know, you're, you're, we're no better than people who don't go to church. We do all the same things, and church is full of hypocrites. What's wrong with that? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it, humorously. When I was living in Edmonton, we had a Presbyterian minister close to our school, um, and his name was Billy Graham which is about as good a name as a minister can get from a catalog. <laughs> You're going to be a minister called Billy Graham at works. But Billy was worthy of his name. He was a character, spiritual and humorous. Billy tells the story with great gusto. He said one day he was in a, in a store, our virgin, version of H-E-B, you know. He said, and this young man comes and says, I know who you are. He said, you're the minister at Brayside Presbyterian. He says, and I belong to your church. He said, but I never come. He said, because you... He said, I know those people, and they're all hypocrites. And Billy said, well, you could come too. There'd be room for one more. Okay. <laughs> but that wasn't his best line. He said, young man, he said, I take that as a compliment. He said, I am running a church just for hypocrites. He said, I don't even want people to come if they're not hypocritical. See, that's Jesus. I've come for sinners. Said, you know, remember the first night when I said, um, Jesus said, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that converts than over 99 righteous people. And I ask this question, does God really like sinners better than righteous people? No, it's a trick question. There are no righteous people. God loves sinners who admit they're sinners. We're all sinners, okay? See, so Jesus says, like Billy Graham, just in a finer language, Jesus says, I have come for hypocrites. The physician comes for the sick. I've come as a doctor. And I've come for those who need a doctor. People who, aren't, who are well don't need a doctor. Okay. But, and Francis emphasized that very, very strongly. Um, and that's why he emphasized the church. One of his basic, again, the church has many dimensions to it. The church is a treasure chest of truth. The church is all the things, you know. That, but the church is also what Francis calls a field hospital. You know, when you're in war, you're binding up wounds. Um, a field hospital, you go, you go out where the wounded are, and he says, and when they're wounded, the first question is not about their sugar levels and their cholesterol. And the first question is, you stop the bleeding. You see, you, the first thing is, you get them alive, you get them healthy. And when people are really healthy, then you start talking about sugar levels and cholesterol. Some people, you never get there. But he said, see, a field hospital, not only are we physicians, we've got to go out to where the people are. You don't wait for the people to come to you, you know. When people come and say, Father, my life is broken, we've got to go towards the broken, towards the wounded. And he's made that the main emphasis of the year of mercy, to go out to the poor, to go out to the wounded, 
and so on. Then, an emphasis from being anxious about issuing cheap grace to risking applying God's mercy. You know, one of the, the, the criticisms that made of, that's made of Francis, um, and I hear it a lot, you know, people say that becomes cheap grace. Once you just dispense God's grace everywhere, well, after a while, you just cheapen the whole thing. It's cheap grace, you know. Well, um, I didn't get a chance to talk to this the last time because I didn't get that far. I was going to talk about that. Let me insert that here. That again, that's sincere, it's false religion. Because it's predicated on a God that isn't prodigal. It's predicated on a God that isn't completely reckless in prodigy and mercy and so on. That's not the God of Jesus. See, the God of Jesus is, is a prodigal God. Is a completely reckless God. Okay, let me give you some examples. Okay. We just had the parable the other day, last week, that said, the sower went out, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is this way. A sower goes out to seed. And he threw some seed onto the, the road, threw some seed into the ditches, some into the stony ground, some into thorn bushes, and some onto good ground. And the other seed all got wasted or it grew up and the birds ate it or whatever. And then the seed on good ground produced 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now, there's many dimensions to that parable. One of them is, you know, what kind of ground. And incidentally, don't start saying, you know, like, I think Jack is the, the rocky soil, and I, you know, <laughs> Pete's kind of the road, and I think I'm the 30%, and, you know, my, my wife's a little better, I think she's the 80%, and so on. Now, first of all, all of us are all of those soils. Inside of all of us, there is rich soil. Inside of all of us, there's some rocky ground. <laughs> There are some thorn bushes, you know. Some places inside the Word of God grows, other places it's choked out, some places it's eaten up by the cares of the world, and so on. And that's half the parable. So half the parable is how what happens to God's word and God's seed in our lives. But the other half, the more important part, that's the theology of God. And you gotta be a farmer to get this. I grew up on a farm. My dad sowed. But he never sowed onto bushes and roads and stone patches. He put the seed only into good ground because he didn't have a lot of seed. See, my father sowed judiciously <laughs> because he had limited seed. All farmers sow judiciously because they have a limit now on the seed. God sows prodigally because God has endless, endless seed. There's no limit to God's mercy. There's no limit to what God gives and so on. And you see that prodigalness in, in nature itself. When you look at nature, just the little we understand of nature, the universe is so big and expanding and stuff that it completely befuddles the mind. Why is God creating hundreds of billions of universes? You know, it takes a pretty reckless God, and not only this planet, why is God having seven billion kids, you know? It's risky enough to have one or two. <laughs> it's just, it's just like God is just risking all these, these billions of kids. You know, I had a fascinating a, a conversation about a year or two ago. I was at a gala supper, and I was across from a scientist from Houston. And so I, I said to him, I said, do you believe there's life on other planets? Uh, well, first, I said, do you believe we'll ever go to the moon? He said, we will, but we won't get back. <laughs> he said, anybody who goes there is going to get fried. He said, you need a spacesuit the size of a huge swimming pool to get anywhere close to Mars, you know. But I said to him, do you think you believe there's life on other planets? He said, as a scientist, no. That's true. Scientifically, there's almost zero chance that there might be life on another planet because of the way the Big Bang happened and so on. And it would be like if you enter a lottery and it's 100 trillion to one and you win it, it's not likely you're going to win a second time, you know. See, the odds of life and stuff and humanity evolving on this planet in the, out of the Big Bang are so many hundred trillion to one. So that if it happened once, scientifically, it's not going to happen again. But in another answer, he says, as a scientist, I don't believe in life on other planets. As a Christian, I do. He said, why would God only have one kid? <laughs> okay. See, he has a child called Earth. He said, he may have ten more, you know. Um, most parents just don't stop at one. <laughs> so, you know, he said, why would God only have one child so he could do this again? See, but it highlights the prodigalness of God, okay? 
and see when we use expressions like cheap mercy, um, two things. First of all, we, we, we don't catch the prodigalness of God. It often speaks of our own poverty. Okay, let me give you another example scripturally. This is the text that easy, that's easy to misunderstand. And it's when, when we had that a couple of weeks ago too in the readings, where the disciples, they fish the entire night and they don't catch any fish. And in the morning they come and here's Jesus by the lake shore. And Jesus says, go a little deeper in the water. And he said, throw your nets to the other side. And they threw their nets to the other side. And then Mark says, they caught such a catch of fish that it began to sink the boats and tear the nets. So here they catch this incredible catch of fish. And what was Peter's reaction? Peter fell on his knees at Jesus and said, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. And you know, at the level of piety, he said, oh, wasn't that a wonderful, pious act? No, Jesus says, raise yourself up. You know, in the face of this miracle, in the face of God's product, product and system, your job is to go out and preach it. Not to say, well, no, oh, this poor little guy. And, you know, no. See, Peter's reaction is wrong. It's wrong. See, in the face of God's goodness, in the face of abundance, he falls to the ground and says, well, I'm not worthy of any of this. Jesus draws him and says, go out. I want you to catch men. This is just fish, you know, and I've just shown you what you can do. See, God's abundance, God's overabundance. Um, see, if we forget about that, then immediately, see, we're always working at everything in our own lives with our own love, with our own attention span, with our own money, with our own energy. It's always limited. We all say, well, if I give it here, I can't give it there. And if, you know, if, I, if I love this person, I won't have time for this other person and so on, because we're limited. And then we begin to lay that on to God, you know. Well, if, you know, uh, if God starts giving out mercy cheaply, you know, what's that going to mean? And... Um, There's no end to it. If I get out, give out anything, it's measured because it's limited. See, God is, and it's so clearly revealed, God is a prodigal, prodigal God. And then not only that, we have this really strong challenge in the Gospels of uh, not worrying about cheap grace. Let me give you the parable, okay? And this parable is actually spoken to Peter. It's very important. This is a parable spoken to Peter, who had just asked Jesus a question. Peter had just said to Jesus, we have given up everything for you, so what are we going to get? And then Jesus says this. Jesus says, I'll tell you, anybody who's given up, and then he gets a list. Father, mother, uh, spouse, children, houses, or lands, for my sake, is going to get a hundredfold of that back, except father. He said, can I get a hundred mothers? 100 houses, 100 children, 100, I don't sure you want all of that, but anyway, so you're going to get 100 of everything except fathers. And why not fathers? Because he's a monotheist. For Jesus, you have only one father, and he's in heaven. Okay. So you're not getting 100 fathers because there is only one father. Okay. He said, you're going to get 100 of everything. I'm going to drown you with life, he said, but there's a catch. In Mark's gospel, he simply says, you're going to get 100 of everything, he said, but not without tribulation. He should have said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> He said, you're going to get it, but you won't enjoy it. Okay, well, that's good. Okay. Um, but in Luke's gospel, he spells out the tribulation. He said, you're going to get a hundred of everything except there's a catch. And this is the catch. Now, it's Jesus talking to Peter. Very important. And Peter said, what are we going to get? We've given our lives for you. So Jesus said, there was a man, a landowner, very rich. Okay, it's God. He said, he goes out one morning and he says, um, See some people that want to work in my vineyard? They said, yes, they go and I'll give you a good day's wage. They go. Uh, two hours later, he finds another group. He says, you want to work in my vineyard? They said, yes, said, go and I'll pay you. Okay. At noon, he finds a third group. He said, you want to work in the vineyard? They said, yes, said, go and I'll pay you. At three in the afternoon, he finds another group. He said, why aren't you working? They said, nobody hired us. He said, go in the vineyard. doesn't promise them anything. And then one hour before it's time to quit, he finds yet another group. He says, why aren't you working? He said, nobody hired us. He said, go into vineyard. Doesn't promise them anything. So this last group works for one hour. And then it's time for, to quit. And he tells the foreman, pay them all, but start with the last ones. So the people who worked for one hour got a full day's wage. Three o'clock people, full day's wage. 
noon day people, full day's wage, and these first groups are licking their chops a bit, you know. And then the 11 o'clock people, full day's wage, the first group comes and they only get a full day's wage. And they're angry. And they say, it's not right. We bore the heat of the day and these people work for one hour. It's not fair that we should get the same wage. And Jesus says, I mean, the landowner said, friend, that's Jesus talking to Peter, soft voice, says, friend, he said, didn't you agree to this? And isn't it a good wage? He said, are you angry and bitter, pardon me, angry and jealous because I'm generous? He says, are you angry and jealous because I'm generous? Okay. Now, notice that parable is addressed to good people who said, we're working hard to get to heaven. So what's going to happen is others. So this is going to happen. Basically, the lesson is this. Jesus says, if you're a good person, you are going to be rewarded a hundred times over. God is going to give you life that you're swimming in it. But this is the catch. You can have everything and enjoy nothing because you're watching what other people are getting. You know, see, the grace in your part isn't cheap. You've worked for it. We've done a lot of hard work. We've given a lot for Jesus. We should go to heaven. <laughs> Whenever I preach to priests and we talk on celibacy, I say, you know what can ruin a priest's heaven? You know, you're celibate your whole life. And then you come to heaven, and the first person you meet is Hugh Hefner from Playboy. <laughs> you say to God, now how did he get in here? And Jesus will say, friend, didn't you agree to this? <laughs> <laughs> and isn't heaven a wonderful place? You know, see, that's our time. Well, it's cheap grace. See, they got it cheaply. Jesus said, there's no cheap grace, you know. Didn't you agree to do this? And isn't it wonderful, you know? Notice that's exactly the same dynamic that plays out between the older brother, the prodigal son, and his dad. Remember, they're inside, they're celebrating, the father comes out to try to draw the son, he says, come in, your younger brother's home, he says, I stayed home, I did all the work, he took your money, spent it on drinking and prostitutes and so on. And he says, son, friend, he says, he says um, you've always been with me, everything I have is yours, heaven is yours. But you have to rejoice. He was dead. You've never been dead. You know, the difference between whether we understand grace or not, Pete Franson used to put this in his books. Pete Franson, you know how you understand grace? Exactly in that parable. So if you get to heaven and you've been this really wonderful, you know, faithful Christian, and you find somebody there and said, how did he or she get in here? That you've never understood grace. I'll bet you if Mother Teresa meets you, Hefner and Hefner, she's going to say, God, I'm glad you made it. <laughs> if she meets Hitler in heaven, she'd say, I'm really glad you made it. I worried my whole life you wouldn't make it. See, they understand grace. You want everybody there. Okay. See, but, but some got in cheaply. See, and that's one of the big criticisms I've made. This is cheap grace. This is cheap grace. It's not cheap grace. Okay. Then he said we have to move from judging the world to hearing what the world is trying to tell us. That's one of his big motifs. That's where he's got in trouble the most. Remember his famous line that's probably the most quoted and uh, most maligned and so on, <clears throat> where he's on an airplane flying back from South America the first time he was there, and someone says, um, what about gay marriage? What about if two people love each other and they're gay and they're in this marriage? And he said, who am I to judge? Two people love each other. He said, who am I to judge? Well, that just shocked and horrified a lot of people, didn't it? Well, the Pope's supposed to be judging. <laughs> if the Pope can't judge this and so on, he said, who am I to judge? These people love each other. He didn't say they're right, he didn't say they're wrong. He just said, who am I to judge? See, his thing is that long before we make any judgments, we have to try to hear what the world is telling us. So we have to try to hear it with an empathic ear, not just hear it. What, what are your kids trying to tell us? What are the kids trying to say when they're not going to Mass? What are angry atheists trying to tell us? What are 10,000 women in this country, Catholic women have left the church because of feminism? What are they trying to tell us? You know, and you don't even have to agree. He said, you have to listen. He said, like, the first thing is to hear and to try to hear it with empathy. See, because in any psychologist will tell you this, before you can offer anybody a challenge, no matter how valid it is, no matter how true you are, the other person first has to know that you love them. You know, take it in, your, in our own lives. You know, we all have faults. If someone comes up to us 
and points out one of our faults, and we know this person doesn't really love us, it's going to make it worse. They're not loving it. They just have goods on you. It's like, do you know what you're like? And so, okay. okay. Where if somebody really loves you, if somebody really loves you, they can say, you know, you're too good a person. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't be living like this. It's helpful. See, so, Francis, we first have to show the world that we love it. We first have to show all these people who are against us that we care about them, that we're hearing what they're saying. You know, again, some of this has been pretty earthy and it's, hasn't always gone over it very well. But, for instance, about three, four years ago, on, or three years ago, on New Year's Day, pro-choice women in New York City took out a full-page ad in the New York Times, and on the ad they just said, Thank you, Francis. You're the first person who listened to us. You know, the, he's not saying abortion's right. He's saying we have to listen to pro-choice. We have to listen to people. And long before there's a judgment, we've got to be listening. And we've got to be listening with some sympathy, not just listening to condemn. You know, when I was a young seminarian, and I had good professors, but in those were the years when we were still very apologetic. So we, we, were, we studied great thinkers. It took us, when we studied Freud, we studied Durkheim and Nietzsche and so on and all this, but it was always, we're going to study them to show them where they're wrong. <laughs> I'm going to explain Freud to you and then you're going to, for your whole priesthood, you'll be able to tell people where Freud was wrong, you know. We're going to study Karl Marx, we're going to study Nietzsche to show you where they went wrong, you know. That was bad pedagogy, you know. I don't agree with those people. They were great minds. It, you know, I tell students, let's study Freud to hear what he's saying. Okay? You don't have to agree with everything he's saying. This is a great mind. Let's study Nietzsche. Nietzsche was a powerful, powerful mind. Maybe one of the most powerful atheistic minds that ever walked this planet. He has a lot to teach us. I don't agree with Nietzsche, but he's worth reading. See? You know, we have to hear, and where is he coming from? Why is he saying these things? And so on. See, that's um, the face of mercy. The face of mercy is a listening face. And if I can risk saying something, and it's, I'm saying the obvious, right now in this country, it's maybe the thing we need the most. You know, in this election, is anybody listening to anybody? Or are we just all scoring points? It's just who can knock anybody out? You know, um, you know listening. You know, so Francis, the, the face of mercy is the face of listening. Now, finally, a story, and then we'll have a coffee break. I want to tell you a story. Um, and then later on, we're going to pick this up between truth and mercy. When I was first ordained, way back, okay, and in those years when you were ordained a priest, um, you were ordained and you had everything, you could do everything in the same ass, except you couldn't hear confessions until you passed a special exam they called jurisdiction. And usually it was the bishop's prerogative. You know, the bishop gives you permission to hear confessions. It was the bishop's prerogative to have this, this jurisdiction exam, except bishops didn't have time to do it. So they usually farm it out to the moral theologians and the faculty staff, you know. And the, the jurisdiction exam always went this way. They'd give you test cases of confession. You know, they were mock confessions. The guy would come in, you know, I did this, I had an abortion, and then how do you handle all these cases and so on. So it was like taking your bar exam, you know. So anyway, <laughs> I took mine with three different moral theologians. Then afterwards, I met with the panel, and they said, well, we're going to pass you, but reluctantly. Okay. <laughs> they said, because, you know, we, we just feel you're not safeguarding truth enough. You know, they said, you know, we, we feel that you're, you're, you're going to be, you're going to feel sorry for people in confession, and you're going to let them off easy. You're going to give out cheap grace, and, you know, it's not, and, and then the moral theologian, the, the head honcho there before I left, he said, so let me give you some warning, Father. He said, just remember this line, the truth will set you free. He said, you're not doing people any favor by giving them cheap grace. They got to be held to the truth. He said, and you'll only do people a favor if, if you do this. I want to say later on, there's a lot of truth to that. Robert C.S. Lewis says, sometimes to say harsh things to people seems cruel, but it's crueler not to say them. You know, you are parents, you raise kids, sometimes you have to do hard things for your kids but it's even crueler not to do it, okay? So I went away, idealistic young priest, remember the truth sets you free. On my very first year of date. And I was in California studying and I go down and during the semester breaks and stuff to one of our parishes in Los Angeles and help out because we're kind of a mega parish. And I was sitting one night with an old priest in his 80s, 
wonderful, saintly old man. He was already blind. He'd say mass by, you know, by memory, and people would do the readings for him and so on. Great old character. So I said to him, I said, Leo, if you had your priest to live over again, would you do it differently? And I fully expected he'd say yes. He said yes. He said, I, 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 he'd say no. I do it. He said no. He said I'd do it very, very differently. He said when I was a young priest, they told me, he said, remember, the truth will set you free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And he said, I think I've been too hard on people. He said, I think, he said, people have so many burdens. And he says, I think I've just put a hard edge to the church sometimes. He said, now you get older, he said, don't do it anymore. He said, no, I don't care. He said, I give people forgiveness. And he said, I'm sure it's going to be okay with God. <laughs> he said, I tell people, if it's, if it, don't worry about it. It's on me. If, if there's any problem with God, I'll straighten it out. You know. <laughs> But he said, people already have so many burdens. He said, they're carrying so much pain. He said, why are we putting more pain on them? Remember, Jesus said the scribes and Pharisees, very sincere religious people. He says, you tie burdens on men's shoulders. You don't lift a finger to lift those burdens off. You know, recently, um, Pope Francis, in a letter to priests, he said, when you're in a confession and someone comes to you, he said, no matter what their issue, he said, your job is to find a road to compassion and a road to mercy. He said, if you can't, then don't hear confessions. He said, don't tell anybody you're too sick to see the doctor. It's quite a line. He said, and that's not just for priests, that's for all of us. He said, we have to find a road to mercy for our people, for our kids, and so on. He said, don't tell anybody you're too sick to see the doctor. You're hopeless. You know? See, that denies the mercy, the prodigalness of God. It denies the mercy of Jesus.